Father, we praise you for this opportunity to once again come together in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this privilege. We would ask that you would just bless us, open our hearts and our understanding to what you have here for us, that in all these things we might grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that we might be more effective servants of our coming King. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the study in the book of Hebrews. Book of, the book of Leviticus, thinly disguised. Yeah. We actually we actually haven't done that. Um, okay, the top of your notepads, for, especially for your newcomers, is to put Acts 17.11, where uh, Luke tells you not to believe anything Chuck Missler tells you. Last time uh, we were in chapter 10, I believe we got down to about verse 18. Is that, uh, I'm getting a nod from the, from the uh, electronic ministry back there. We got the heresy filters in, in, in place and we'll get moving here. Um, uh, we, uh, there, there are two uh, difficult passages in the book of Hebrews, very difficult passages, Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 that has to do with apostasy. And one thing, uh, we talked a lot about that when we were in chapter 6. We'll touch up on again tonight when we get later here, the tail end of chapter 10. It's interesting that between chapter 6 and 10, we have chapter 7, 8, and 9. Now, that's not a very profound observation, except <laughs> you were impressed with that, weren't you? I could tell. Um, 7, 8, and 9 deal with the priest, priesthood of Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, one of the things, if you get too hung up on chapter 6 and 10, like it's all over, gee, I did that once and now there's no hope for me kind of feeling, recognizing that why did uh, the writer put in chapters 7, 8, 9 and emphasize the priestly work of Jesus Christ, but for the fact that his priestly work avails for you and I. So as we get into this apostasy thing, and it's a heavy passage we're working our way into near the end of chapter 10, Let's not lose sight of the fact that that's why he ever liveth to make intercession for you and I. In fact, I could probably say that if you're worried about chapter 10, that the very fact that you're worried about demonstrates that you haven't got the problem. That's, uh, you know, uh, whenever we get in one of these uh, unpardonable kinds of things, you get, you know, you justifiably get pretty nervous. Uh, one thought that was uh, heavily emphasized here then um, in the early part of chapter 10, I'd like to just remind you, uh, one of the key contrasts that the writer presses here, now bear in mind, he's been the, the, the letter is written to Hebrews, those that have come out of Judaism, they're Christian believers, but they've come out of Judaism, um, and he continually demonstrates that Christ you know, fulfilled, set aside these things that uh, of the past. And one of the emphasis, one of the things he he pointed out, we talked about the sacrifices. We went through last time all the different kinds of sacrifices to get a feeling for that. Um, but those sacrifices were repetitive. The, the 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 sin debt that we have had to be renewed every year. Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. The high priest went and made his offering for himself and for the people, and went through all this ritual, to present the blood in the Holy of Holies. Once a year, every year. Now, that blood was shed on, on our behalf. Uh, we say idiomatically the camp of Israel um, for our sin, teaching us that by the shedding of blood, we are, uh, the, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But it had to be done every year, and it was sort of like a note renewal. It's sort of like, gee, you have a debt, and the debt is rolled over each each. Uh, each year, and and the writer makes a contrast of that procedure, which was there to instruct and teach and highlight and foreshadow the sacrifice that really did put away sin. The the, the blood of sheep and goats didn't do it; they were just emblematic, pointing to the, the 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 shedding of our Lord and Savior's blood once and for all for sin. And we went through that last time. The totelestai, it is finished, paid in full. That whole routine. We went through that last time. But that brings us to now um, um, the end uh, to verse 19, I'm, uh, I, I believe. 
So the writer continues, Now, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He's going to go on. He's going to give us three let us phrases in verses 22, 23, and 24. In other words, having established that Jesus Christ has fulfilled these sacrifices and, and uh, 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 entered into a whole new covenant, he's suggesting in verse 19 that we should have the boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, the flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, we then have three let us phrases. Now, it's interesting um, that um, we're going to see, we have seen several places, but we're going to see here several times in this chapter, and especially, then this is going to lead into this famous chapter 11. I can hardly wait to get chapter 11. Um, uh, Incidentally, Arthur W. Pink's commentary on the book of Hebrews has 1,300 pages on, on, the, on the epistle of Hebrews. Yeah, I usually like to read almost everything I get my hands on for these things. and I, I, I broke my pick on, on Arthur W. Pink. That's a lot of reading. But also, I think he's got a chap, I think he's got something like 14 chapters, just on chapter 11, you know. Abel and Enoch. You know, so anyway, we get, but when we get to chapter 12 and 13, he's going to wrap up, and you're going to discover that this, obviously, very crisply, that the book of Hebrews is more than this call to the Jewish believers to get out of Judaism, not go back to what they have been redeemed from, but to, to abide in Jesus Christ. But he goes on to make lessons or, or exhortations or, or, or um, pleas for all of us. And we see that here in verses 22, 23, and 24. Let us, and I want you to notice the emphasis here then, is not those guys, it's us. And this is the writer is including himself. Now, as you know, I believe the writer was Paul, but I won't beat, beat that one to death. I'll prove it to you before the chapter's over. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to insist upon these things, but we have about three proofs a week, I think. Um, but the point is, so he's talking about us as, as uh, believers, and I would suggest sophisticated believers, Hebrew believers. Uh, let us. Now, uh, there's, a, there's a thought here. Three times do we find this let us phrase. And one of the things that hit me in going through this, um, it's clear the Holy Spirit would not have the believers in isolation. Now, of course, in Romans, you know, we should not forsake the assembling together and so forth. We have those passages that uh, go, go right to the heart of the matter. But you'll also notice all the way through here, you'll discover, I think, that the Holy Spirit is speaking in the tone that the believer should be in fellowship in a group, in a, in a, in a, in a group. So the, it's a plural, first person plural, let us. Draw near, we're going to draw near, we're going to hold fast, and we're going to consider um, uh, one another. Now, you could, we could obviously do that. There's a whole sermon outline. See, we could spend the whole hour building on this threefold outline. I'll spare you that. But it's there, and let the Spirit talk to you about that if that's what he would do. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Now, there's that word faith. We're going to learn a lot about that in the next chapter. Assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, you notice the sprinkled is an idiom picked from the earlier discussion of sacrifice, the sprinkling of the blood, right? Now, sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, is he talking about water? What do you think he's talking about? Of the word, right. He's speaking again. He's, he's using this Levitical idiom, and we mentioned last time, or several times, I guess, that we have, we wash two different ways. We wash judicially, in his blood. We're washed in his blood in the sense of being uh, judicially positioning us as having a remission of sins. But that's, that's a once and for all thing. It was done at the cross. Right? 
But the washing of the water by the word, using Ephesians 4 for as an example, occurs how often? Daily, all the time, continually. So we're washed in another sense continually. And he's using both idioms here in this expression. Sprinkled from an evil conscience, that's the blood. And uh, our bodies washed with, a, with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a few verses. And he's going to hit that pretty hard. Let, let us hold fast the profession of faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And then the third let us, verse 24, consider one another to provoke hey, that's all right, unto love and to good works. I provoke a lot. I'm not sure it's, you know, to love or unto love or to good works. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Now, it's interesting that the writer is emphasizing that our need for fellowship is going to increase as the day approaches. Now, most of us here in this gathering uh, are probably prophecy nuts or certainly sensitive to this, to the fact that we harbor the view, with some justification, I believe, that we are in the end times. Well, that's not a time then to dig in and hide and go to a cave or get into a monastic mode, okay? No, a lot of people do that. There's various forms of that. And um, there's also a time when we should probably uh, uh, not make a big thing of our uh, various divisions and, and styles and denominations. I happen to be one of these guys that's very not only non-denominational, anti-denominational. That's why I guess I enjoy Calvary so much, because there's such an emphasis on just the word and fellowship and very little you know, of the trappings of, of programs and denominationalism. But I'm. Uh, but uh, uh, this is a time when, uh, indeed, we might give some prayer to the, for the body to collectively uh, uh, be um, um, growing together. Because, as we see, as it says here, as we see the day approaching. Now, verses twenty-six on, uh, particularly, uh, you know, there's about half a dozen verses here that uh, our time would be so much easier if they weren't here. But I have to face them, so let's jump in. This is heavy, heavy stuff. Verse 26. For if we sin willfully, by the way, that's a, a um, present participle, meaning continual or habitually. Okay, not just once, but it means that you're abiding in sin. But it's also a very specific sin. For if we sin willfully, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. And the reference here, of course, is the Old Testament, full of examples where there's fairly severe dealing with someone that didn't take the law seriously. He goes on to make a point, verse 29, of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant with which he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Now see the contrast there. Now what he's dealing with here, the writer's dealing with here, are those who willfully, obstinately reject the atonement of Jesus Christ. Um, God is patient. God is diligent. God will strive, but only to a point. And there is a point at which God has no more need to strive. And uh, I'm going to naively believe that the people in this room uh, are not in that category. But then again, why shouldn't be so presumptuous? Um, I doubt most of you that would spend an evening in this, especially an hour and a half going through this, are not people who have a, an animosity to the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. But you run into people like that. And what this is really saying is, is that um, um, we're going we're, we're gonna to shortly, when we get to chapter 11, we're going to go through a chronicle of the faithful. 
And one of the undertones of chapter 11 is that God has never had more than one way of saving a person. We think of the way through faith in Jesus Christ as a New Testament idea, but obviously the Old Testament saints were saved, but not on a different basis. They're saved on the basis of faith. And interestingly enough, the faith in Jesus Christ. And, and chapter 11 is going to demonstrate that. God's never had an alternative program. And uh, what we're seeing here in verse 29 is the emphasis that you reject that program and there are no alternatives. There's no backup. That's the long and the short of it. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. Now, that sounds kind of heavy-handed. But rejecting God's gift of the atoning blood of Jesus Christ is doing just that. Isn't that heavy? So that's something that um, deserves a lot of attention and a lot of prayer. For your own position, I'm going to assume that everyone here has understood and made a commitment to Jesus Christ, has accepted God's provision for their sin. But on the other hand, um, all through the scripture you'll discover that there's no, uh, uh, no one takes that lightly. You'll find the whole concept of salvation is a heavy, heavy issue. The whole, God, the whole um, plan of redemption is God's primary preoccupation. I think I've often mentioned to you how fascinated I am that if you talk about the creation of the universe, you sort of think of that as sort of a, a big deal. Huh? One book in the Bible. In fact, a couple of chapters in the book of Genesis. And count Isaiah 45 and a couple of Psalms and you've got it. The creation sort of dealt with. I suspect that there's probably less than ten chapters in the scripture. I forgot I was going to count that once. There's half a dozen Psalms that focus on that. And there's a couple of passages like Isaiah 45 and, and Job 38 and a few things, right? And you got it. Now, let's talk about the redemption of God. In contrast, you know, the creation, that's a big deal. You know, we look through a telescope and we're awed. We look through a microscope and we're equally awed. The creation of God is a big deal. Yet the scripture deals with, you know, what shall I say, 10%? I'd be being generous. Let's talk about his redemption. Most of the good part of Genesis is on redemption, but let's just take the book of Exodus, Joshua, book of Revelation. I could probably count most of the epistles, the gospels. How many of the prophets? But you got 70% of the scripture, not on the creation, on your redemption. Interesting. It's also interesting to me that um, scientists or intellectuals, you can argue if you have an open mind that the heavens declare the glory of God. Indeed, they do. They don't declare his redemption. Why? Because of the curse. Very good. The creation is under the curse. It can declare the existence of God. You could, we've, had, we've had a number of examples under uh, of people who have had an opportunity in their classes or whatever to, to testify to the existence of God through, through just our intellectual awareness of basic principles. But not the redemption. The redemption can only come through revelation. And that revelation leads to faith, and it's the faith that saves us. And that link we're going to deal with here in chapter 11 shortly. Now, if somebody disparages the redemption of God. Heavy trip. That's what he's saying here. Heavy, heavy trip. In other words, don't take it for granted. Now, if God, uh, uh, many of you here are old friends, many of you here are new, some for the first time tonight. If God has been dealing with you relative to the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, if that isn't a very deep, primary commitment of your life to be uh, under the blood of Jesus Christ. If that doesn't, uh, if that don't, there's nothing more important in your life. Financially, professionally, excuse me girls, even your marriages, whatever. Nothing's more important. 
than your relationship with Jesus Christ and, and having his shed blood avail for you. So I'm going to so in such a cavalier fashion assume that's taken for granted. But if it isn't, don't go to sleep tonight without that thing, without that issue being resolved, without that thing hit head on. And whether you come up here afterwards or deal with it yourself in the privacy of your bedroom before going to bed or whatever, but uh, uh, commit yourself uh, to his saving shed blood. You've got us go on. Uh, oh, one, one uh, um, I have to live up to my reputation of trivia. Uh, verse 29 ends with a spirit of grace, okay? That sound, may sound very familiar to you, but it only appears twice in the Scripture. Once in the New Testament here, once in the Old Testament, Zechariah 12.10. I don't know what you do with that piece of information, but uh, it's interesting, the spirit of grace, that, that expression happens to only occur twice. But now we get into something else that's kind of interesting. Um, our writer goes on in verse 30, and he quotes twice from Deuteronomy. Verse 30 says, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth to me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Now, what he's doing here, the writer is quoting twice from Deuteronomy. He happens to be quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 35 and 36. No big deal. 36, he quotes very literally from the Hebrew. Verse 35 of Deuteronomy 32, he does not quote exactly from the Hebrew, nor does he quote exactly from the Septuagint. Mostly, in most of the epistles, you'll find the quotes from the Old Testament are either taken from the Hebrew text or from the Greek text, that is the Septuagint, the, about uh, 285 B.C. or 270 B.C., depending when they start or finish. But anyway, the, the 70 scholars translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, and that document, the, the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, was widely used in the day uh, of, the, of the epistles. And you'll find many of the quotes in the epistles are from the Septuagint. Now, why, now this particular quote happens to be from neither the author is using his own rendering of the text. It's not quite exactly like the Hebrew, and it's not quite exactly like the Septuagint. It's no big deal, except it occurs one other time. The same phrase occurs in Romans 12, verse 19. The author of the epistle to Romans quotes chapter 12, in chapter 12, verse 19. He says, Vengeance belongeth to me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, in the Greek, it's clear by the people who study these things carefully, that it's not being quoted exactly from the Septuagint, nor from the Hebrew. The author of the book, epistle to Romans chooses to render that expression from Deuteronomy uh, 32, 35, his own little way. But it's interesting that he does it twice. He does it in Romans 12, and he does it in Hebrews 10. No big deal, other than it's another one of these uh, suggestions that it, there is the fingerprint of Paul on the epistle to Hebrews. We talked about that the first time, why we believe it's Paul, and also why we believe Paul would not have signed it if he did do it. And so um, he's speaking from the logic and not from his authority as an apostle. So, uh, but anyway, going on. Um, verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Boy, there's a sentence that you could tack up on your bedroom wall, huh? <laughs> it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know, most of us probably don't really take all this that seriously. I mean, we're sort of concerned and we want to walk a Christian walk and we want to sort of grow in grace and we want to you know, but we sort of comfortable. We sort of take it for granted. Um, you know, and, and and also, especially when we're in prophecy classes, you know, we sort of talk about the 70th week of Daniel, there's going to be seven years of this, so there's going to be that before the Lord comes back and all of that. Um, you know, the Lord could come, come, for any one of us tonight, driving home. Uh, he could take us at any moment. And one of the things that we should not take for granted is to make sure our insurance policies are paid up. 
And I don't mean that in the secular sense. I mean that in the sense that we really know where we stand with him. You know, I'm very fond of this uh, 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 evangelical thing that, that sometimes is used. Um, um, and I've used it myself in prophecy discussions, you know, where after, especially after covering a lot of texts that really sort of gives you a sense of the preeminence of the return of Jesus Christ. It's interesting to contemplate the idea that if uh, if I could tell you that Jesus Christ is returning to the planet Earth at 1.30 this evening, 1.30 in the morning, in other words, you know, an hour and a half after midnight, the Lord is returning to the planet Earth. What's your reaction to that? Now, obviously, I'm being rhetorical. Don't go run around and quote me. That Chuck says going to come In that sense, you know, the feeling that you get when you think about that idea obviously ought to be joy. Most of you will lie and say, oh, I think it's great. Some of you, I'm sure, feel that sincerely. On the other hand, some of you out here may feel, ooh, not tonight. I mean, <laughs> I'm not quite ready. Why not? What is it you got left undone? Boy, I'd, I'd hop to it. Uh, I, I would... Uh, um, I would uh, kneel down with the Lord and talk that over. Uh, you ought to be ready. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something that, uh, well, gee, I don't want to yet. I, I'm going to meet all those guys and some of the books I haven't read yet. Get on with it, you know. You know, this whole idea of, uh, of uh, a living God and, and recognizing that um, we're in a little parenthesis called uh, the physical universe and our own little, our days are as a hand breath, you know, uh, uh, I think many of you out there probably have had recent reminders of just how frail we are. Um, I had a friend that I'm doing some work with uh, went to his office and he was a changed. I hadn't seen him for about two weeks and I got in his office. He was a changed person. Well, his wife got cancer. Now they caught it. It's fine. So there's, but he says, you know, that really changes perspective. He's worked for a dozen years building his company and he suddenly realized that doesn't mean much. You know, it's called relationships and people and. And our days are as a hand breath. And I, as I look over this audience, I could probably pick out most of you and say that you've probably got 1,500 weekends. That's about all. <laughs> now, if I, you know, if I say 30 years, that's abstract, you know. But 1,500 weekends, that's somehow finite, isn't it? And, uh, you know, next time we meet, it'll be, you know, 1,499. <laughs> our days are as a hand breath. Well, I didn't. I got off my notes here. All right. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. It is indeed. Verse thirty-two. But call to remembrance the former days in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great flight of afflictions. Now he's going to go through here and remind these readers of the things that they, uh, some of them, have been endured. Ye endured a great flight of afflictions, partly while ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while ye became companions of them who were so used. For ye had compassion on me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward." Now, incidentally, I want to underline that word reward. Much of what the writer is talking about here has to do with rewards, not salvation. There's a, there's a lot of ideas together here, so let me just leave that with you. Um, verse 36, For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he shall come. Excuse me. He, excuse me. He that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now, incidentally, not a big deal, but he happens to be paraphrasing from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. In verse 38, he quotes from Habakkuk chapter 2, the next verse, verse 4. Now, normally we'd go and look this up, but it's not that fruitful. There's a lot of other things I want to deal with tonight, so I make that those of you that want to track that down can can look that on your own, but verse 37 is a paraphrase of Habakkuk 2.3. Verse um, 38, he quotes from Habakkuk 2.4. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now, that's a summary of what we've been talking about. 
The just shall live by faith. But there's a strange verse in Luke chapter 9, verse 62. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. When you're committed to Jesus Christ, you're like a pawn. You go forward, there's no retreat. If you don't look over your shoulder, you keep going. You're, you're his way. Now, the just shall live by faith. You've probably heard that expression a lot if you've done some biblical reading. That's, of course, a, a, a phrase from Habakkuk 2.4. But it's also uh, been suggested that that is a sort of a, uh, a unifying concept that Paul wrote three letters to amplify. The just shall live by faith. Who are the just? The book of Romans describes who the just are. What do you mean by the just? You mean those that live perfect lives? No, those that are justified in Jesus Christ. And the book of Romans explains that thoroughly, definitively. The just shall live. How shall they live? The book of Galatians describes that. A call out of religious externalism and, and uh, to live by faith. The just shall live, how? By faith. The book of Hebrews has been building up and is going to climax on that in chapter 11. We're about at the peak, uh, the capstone of the book of Hebrews in many respects. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. That's you and I. Those other guys that pull back. You and I are... Okay. Um, a lot of other things we could talk about, but I'm tempted to use the time. There's no way we're going to get through, through chapter 11, but I'd sure like to jump in. Um, if you pick a chapter... Well, if you picked a small number of chapters in the Scripture to, to, to uh, get a command of, you obviously 1 Corinthians 13, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, you know, you have, you have your little list. On that list would have to be Hebrews 11, sometimes called the Hall of Faith. Now, it's famous because it's going to go, go right through. It's going to be a, a review of the Old Testament. And we'll, we'll take the next 27 months to go through. No, not really. Um, but also, all through the, the, the chapter 11, you're going to get some real interesting little insights. And it starts out with a bang. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And, you know, we could talk a lot about that. Um, the substance of things hoped for. Faith um, doesn't have to do with proven things. Faith does not have to do with tangibles. Um, it's interesting uh, how Thomas, in the first meeting of the disciples, that he was absent. Uh, they were all met. He wasn't there, and the Lord appeared to them. And when he heard about that meeting, he didn't buy it, remember? And... Um, Next time they were all together, Thomas was with them. And, of course, again, the doors were locked. The Lord appears among them and uh, turns to Thomas. And Thomas had said, you know, um, unless I put my finger in his nail prints and my hand in his thigh, I won't believe. The Lord appears and walks up to Thomas and says, okay, fella, here's your chance. Thomas, of course, falls on his knees and says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, you have seen and believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and believed. The whole idea of faith is taking God at his word. God is a, puts a high premium on being believed. Now, if he tells you that it's, you know, nighttime, the sky is black, that's no big deal. I mean, you can go out and say, oh, yeah, great, you know. But if he tells you that, that uh, something um, unusual and you buy it because he said so, that counts heavily with him. And it's interesting to see that God has gone out of his way throughout the entire scripture to do things that are kind of, that you and I would consider strange. And uh, First uh, Corinthians chapter two deals with chapter one and two deals with this. Chapter one particularly where you know it's, it, it speak the phrase occurs the foolishness of God. It's a wild phrase. When you just how can you speak of the foolishness of God? Well, all kinds of ways, you know, that he would save the human race by a boat. Noah building this 
ark, this barge in his driveway, saving the entire world. You know, that's a, that's a weird way, you know, to stop and think about it. Um, uh, you can talk about Samson, the jawbone of an ass. Uh, you, can, you, can, you, can, uh, you can go through uh, uh, Naaman the Syrian and, and Elijah and the, and the business of curing his leprosy, go wash in the, in the, you know, the river, muddy river, and seven times. And of course, he, uh, you, 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 can, you can go through the whole scripture and you can almost make a Bill Cosby kind of humor thing out of it. Jericho and the walls come tum- tumbling down. I mean, what a strange way to deal with, you know, why does God do that? Well, his ways are not our ways. Yeah, yeah, that's what he says. In Isaiah. But why does he do that? Because he... P- Probably lots of reasons, but one of them is he puts a premium on us believing him. You know, if uh, he gave uh, you know Joshua you know a lot of mortar backup and and some ground assault troops and maybe a couple of airstrikes, uh, you know, but um, no, Joshua, you're going to march around the city quietly. You're going to absolutely keep silence. You're going to march around the city once a day for six days. Seventh day, you're going to march around, and uh, on the seventh time, you're going to blow your trumpets, and the wall's going to come down. I would love to see Joshua explain that to his chief of staff the day before they start this thing. <laughs> and he did it. He did it. Now, God had a lot of reasons for doing it that way, but one of them was to test their faith. Did they, could they keep their mouths shut for six days? They did. Kept silence. And then they blew the trumpets acting out in model what the book of Revelation was going to amplify thousands of years later when another Yehoshua was going to dispossess the usurpers with his troops. And once again, there would be silence in heaven for half an hour. And then chapter 8 would start and the seven trumpets. And there's a pattern that God is setting down. Just as he set down patterns in the offerings in Leviticus that became fulfilled in Jesus Christ, in the book of Joshua he sets down patterns in the book of Revelation that's going to amplify and it won't be just Canaan. We're talking about the planet Earth coming up. God has his ways. But um, he puts a premium on being believed. You probably have your uh, parents. You have children, especially if you're, and if you're an extremist, like you know, on a boat or something, you tell your kid to do something, you have time to explain why. You expect him to do it, he or she. Right? There's, a, there's a premium as a parent you put on doing what they're told. And God's the same way. You expect he, it's a call to being believed. It's a call to obedience. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, that's a strange phrase. What do you mean, evidence of things not seen? You can have evidence that they're there without depending on your eyes. In fact, it fascinates me that God uses the ears, not the eyes. I remember reading an a, 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 a essay once. I thought the guy was a screwball. He pointed out that the eyes are the windows of Satan. Satan uses our eyes. He used it with Eve. The fruit was desired to be, you know, and so forth. You, you, if you study that, you'll discover Satan uses our uh, eyes as a window of temptation. God uses the ears. Faith cometh by hearing, Romans ten seventeen says. It's interesting to me that uh, I thought it was crazy at first, but as I read the scripture, I, I, I think there may be some substance to that. It's evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders received witness. Uh, verse 3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed, or the ages, if you must, uh, were framed by the word of God. Now, this sounds like the first three verses of the Gospel of John. Let's turn to that, refresh our memory. You probably have it memorized, but it's worth reading again. John the writer, now in Hebrews we're talking about Paul, but John the writer uses the word of God as a title of Jesus Christ. If somebody asked you a definition of truth, everybody knows what truth is, but when everybody knows what it is, it's harder to find. The toughest ones are the obvious ones. What's truth? I don't know. know. What's truth? Something that's not false doesn't count. What's truth? There's several definitions, but the one that my wife came up with that blew me away. Truth is when the word and the deed become one. 
You speak truth when what you when you do what you said you're going to do. Okay. God said that by the seed of the woman men would be delivered. And Jesus Christ was the incarnation of that promise. But mo- far more than that, probably everything that God said became fulfilled in a person by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So Jesus is in a very mystical way the incarnation of God's word. Not just that God said Christ was going to do that, you know, be born of a virgin and met in Bethlehem. Probably everything that God expressed that we're you know, that to us is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And that's what John is dealing with here in the first few verses. In the beginning was the Word. He's announcing the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. And the Word was with God. He's announcing His distinct personality from the Father. And the Word was God, or precisely God was the Word. They pre-existed. They're distinct and yet of the same substance. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And, and of course, John launches into his gospel. Going back to Hebrews 11. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. How do we know that? You weren't there. Almost anybody you care to talk to or read about weren't there either. Some people argue, therefore, it cannot be the realm of science because science is the, sci- is, the, is, the, is the business of observation. No one was there to observe. So you've got some interesting problems if you want to wrestle with cosmology. You're on very, very shaky ground. But um, who, who, who was there? That's what, that's what God asked Job. Chapter 38. Where were you when the foundations of the Lord were, you know, where were you, fella? You want to judge me? Where were you? When all this then goes on very eloquently about all things that happen. There are a couple there. Let us make man in our own image. So there's a dialogue going on among persons. Who was there? The participants in Psalm 2. Psalm 2, same thing. They're talking to each other, the three of them. Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Okay, i got a platform here. I knocked this, Okay. And I say, is this solid? What is this, solid? Sounds pretty solid. If somebody said it's more empty than solid, they're more right than we are. Because less than one-tenth of one percent of this is matter, and the rest of it is energy fields. You want to get into it, right? That which we call substance doesn't really exist. We have materials that fundamentally are made of molecules. Molecules are made of atoms. And the atoms are basically highly energetic particles, quite distant from one another, but that have um, the ability to interact with other things by virtue of the electrical fields. But the substance of there is mostly space. Very strange. But more importantly, uh, uh, as we, most of us that have been in, in uh, uh, science programs, uh, high school or college, are familiar with what we sometimes call the Bohr model of the atom. You know, we have a nucleus, typically consisting of some Protons and neutrons, right? Positively charged, and then we have a thing called we have a thing called a a, a a proton, and then we have a thing called an electron. Electrons negatively charged, protons positively charged. Proton weighs about eighteen hundred and forty-five times what electron does. Electron spins around the proton. If you have one proton, one electron, you have a hydrogen atom. And you, if you add enough, pro, you, the more protons you add, the more electrons you add. You go right through the periodic table, and you account for all the elements that we see in nature, plus a few more. And um, but what's interesting is, can you see an atom? No. Why? Because it's smaller than the wavelength of light. So it's impossible to be seen. So how do we know atoms exist? Well, there's Hiroshima and Nagasaki. No, no. How do we know atoms exist? We Inferentially, right? Some of you in the, in the room are probably uh, in, in either in the medical or semiconductor field. And in, in the semiconductor industry, when you've got circuits to look at, you don't look at them in a microscope. That's useless. You look in, in, at what's called a scanning electron microscope, or a SEM, as they're called, scanning electron microscope. You don't really look at the circuit. You look at a picture that's created on a screen by a thing being bo- bombarded with electrons rather than light waves because the circuits are so small that light is relatively ineffective. You need to magnify it more times, five, ten thousand times, 
and you do that with an electron microscope, right? Well, how interesting it is that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. That's basic science today. I don't know how Paul knew. How did he know? Through faith. God said so. I'm fascinated too. You know, we got major, major scientific programs trying to figure out what binds the nucleus together. We learned very early that electron, you know, like charges repel and unlike charges attract. Sort of like a magnet, right? North and south poles attract, two norths or two souths repel. Magnetic fields are a little different, but electro- electrical fields, same thing. Two electrons tend to repel each other. Electron and the positively charged particle tend to attract. Well, terrific. We learned to go through all through high school and college and learn about the Bohr model of the atom. We got all these protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and we got these electrons running around. Electrons won't get too far from the nucleus because they're bound by the combination of their energy and the fact that they're negative, and the nucleus is positive. Terrific. They attract. Well, then somewhere, you know, someone will raise their hand and say, wait a minute. If we got all these protons that make up the nucleus and like charges repel one another, what's holding the nucleus together? Answer? They don't know. There are all kinds of theories. There are millions of dollars being spent in the U.S. and the Soviet Union and in Europe trying to unlock the riddle of the glue, facetiously spoken, the, the binding forces of the, of the nucleus of an atom. And there's quarks and all these strange names for pseudo-particles or real particles, particles that have momentum but no mass. Chew on that a while. Um, <laughs> And, 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 and they go around, and you can find out the answer in Colossians. Chapter 1, verse 18. What holds it together? Jesus Christ, by whom all things are held together. That's what it says. Now, Chuck, you're oversimplifying. Maybe. That's the <laughs> wonderful thing about believing God, taking him at his word. Very, very simple. Well, you can't take God at his word. God says that, you know, the, the Bible, you know, presents a, a geocentric universe. Well, it doesn't really, but I'll buy that. Let's assume it does. Well, every Ptolemy thought the sun went around the earth, but Copernicus proved that was wrong. Well, Copernicus may not have been as smart as he thought he was. Because Einstein says that the, everything's relative. Everything's relative. The whole physical universe is relativistic. That is, you can, your, not only your space and your time, uh, your, your mass, but the time itself, your, the, your, your, your time domain is a physical property, and it's relative to somebody else, and its transfer functions allow you to convert from one to the other. Terrific. Well, if that's true, then any reference, I can arbitrarily take any reference point to be my reference plane, right? So if I choose the center of the Earth, no one can prove me wrong in modern physics. So I can take a geo, I can go back, I can go full circle, I can go back to Ptolemy if I like, and I can say, gee, the, the Earth, I believe the Earth is the center of the universe. And all these other motions when netted out against God's scale, I would not say, I don't know this, I just would not surprise me if the earth is the center of the universe. Where's the abuso in the center of the earth? Where did Jesus Christ descend after his death? Or the center of the earth, the belly of the earth. Where's Gehenna? The outer darkness, someplace else. Gehenna and Hades are, are, are opposites. And you get into that, it's interesting, you know, and so... How do you get into all this? I read off the path. Then. Back to the 11th chapter. <laughs> Through faith we understand that the worlds are framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. I believe we're going to find out that this existence you and I are temporarily in is a very special temporary experiment established for God's own pleasure for some very temporary purposes. We're limited to physical things. God isn't. We even in, in, in even within the range of our science can understand hyperspaces and talk about um, existences that are mass free. And if they're mass free, they have no time. It's not a question of just having a lot of time. They have no time. So uh, it's interesting that God has placed us here in this uh, in this environment for some very special reasons. So we we understand that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Verse 4. Now we, now we jump from the abstract or conceptual down to a review. And uh, we could, uh, 
and, and rather than outline it or go for some profound overlay, we're just going to jump in and just see what he says. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Let me tell you, that's a mouthful. I'm going to take for granted most of us heard the story. You know, we you know we obviously know Adam and Eve, and uh, uh, and they had and 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 God when He declared war on Satan, Genesis three. You know, I put enmity between thee and the woman, and so forth. He declares war on Satan. That was His response to the fall: declare war on Satan. Um, he gave the promise that by the seed of the woman, mankind would be delivered. And they, Adam and Eve, probably figured, boy, the firstborn would be it, right? Maybe second, third. The line becomes Seth, and it's later. But meanwhile, there's Cain and Abel. Now, um, there are a lot of overtones of this. Satan's probably figuring to, to somehow knock one off and contaminate the other one to start breaking, trying to get at, trying to thwart the plan of God. He's been doing that for some time and never hasn't given up yet. But um, Cain and Abel uh, are described as both giving offerings to God. Now, that's got to be a good deal. I mean, you know, what's wrong with that? Giving an offering to God, and we usually see it because G. Cain was a you know was a farmer, so he gave the produce of the land, and and Abel was a shepherd, so he gave a lamb, and that misses the point. The the the, the vocations had nothing to do with it. Abel offered a lamb. If you get into that, you'll find about it speaks of the fat and so forth. Um, what Abel was doing was offering what God had instructed them to offer. God ordained, it appears, ordained a sacrificial lamb from Eden onward. It gets memorialized later in Leviticus and so forth. Uh, but even before Moses, when we see the offering of Abraham, we find him offering. By faith, we're going to discover that Abram had revelations. You and I had nowhere. We're going to learn a lot about Abraham. Sure, a few more verses. But point is, the the story becomes clear if you understand that Abel was offering a lamb as per the instructions of God. Therefore, the lamb was an offering of faith. It pointed to Calvary. It happened much much later, and the amount of insight they may have had, we have no insight into. They may have really understood a lot about what God was going to do. Or they may have understood only a little. We don't know. My, the more I read the scripture, the more I'm beginning to believe that they probably understood a lot more than we give them credit for. Especially Abraham. And I'll come to that. That's why. I, now, Cain offered the works of his hands. We've got faith in works here. Okay? That's what's going on. And um, so... Um, Abel has given a sacrifice for his sin. What's implied in Abel's offering is that he's acknowledging that he's a sinner. Just as God taught Adam and Eve that without the shedding of blood, they would not be covered by giving them coats of skins. That was God's object lesson there. Abel is acknowledging that he's a sinner, and he's responding to a blood sacrifice to deal with that. So Abel is righteous, okay? What's Cain's reaction to the fact that Abel's offering is accepted by God? And by the way, the, the, another overtone of the story, we don't know, how did Cain know? There are all kinds of theories, but, you know, that the fire came down and consumed it in those days. There are all kinds of crazy ideas that you've seen that, that scholars have come up with. But the point is, somehow, Abel knew that his offering was accepted by some procedure. Cain knew it wasn't. That's what got him so enraged. So enraged, he murdered Abel. That's what they said. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith. Now that implies, see, that Abel had a revelation. Maybe from his parents. But he was doing what God asked him to do. And he believed that God would accept the shed blood to cover his sin. The whole Levitical concept is present there. 
Otherwise, the by faith doesn't make sense. See? By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Interesting. That he obtained witness that he was righteous. You mean he was sinless? In a Levitical sense, yes. Because the shed blood, you know, the, the offering, the, the blood offering took care of that. God testifying of his gifts. See, somehow that's where scholars get this idea that God responded visibly to the acceptability of the offering. How, we don't know. But that's where, that's where scholars get this idea. And by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. Abel's dead, but he speaks to you right now tonight. He's in effect. His life of faith, his commitment of faith, speaks to you tonight. Speaks to you long before the Ten Commandments. Long before the laws of Moses. Long before even Abraham. Long before even Noah. And so on. Okay. Verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated. The word we'd use in the, if we were going to use the Vulgate would be raptured. Now, you and I use the term rapture because that term c- comes from rapturo, which is Latin. It comes from the Vulgate Bible, which is a little bizarre because you and I don't relate to the Vulgate Bible, the Latin Bible particularly. We really relate to the Greek or the Hebrew or the, you know, whatever. Are you with me? But still, the word rapture, to be snatched away, is a word that has uh, become part of our New Testament vocabulary. And uh, the word translated is a little more quaint. We mean translated, not like language, but translated like going from this life to the next life without passing through death. That's the concept. You see, he was translated that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had translated him. And you get the impression they hunted for him, don't you? Huh? I have no idea what happened. It's kind of interesting, though, that uh, that um, he was not found. Now, you sort of get the impression that the antediluvian world went around with search parties and looking for Enoch and but he should not see death. He was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Whew, what a nice testimony to have. That's all Paul ever wanted. Paul worked day and night, carried three jobs, worked continually. For what purpose? That he might please God, so that when that day comes, that he could feel that God would be pleased with him. Enoch must have been cut of the same cloth, I bet. Now, you know, there's one thing about Enoch. I can't pass over Enoch without pointing out something to you. Um, it's um, it's fun to if you're in a Bible trivia quiz. What you do is uh, one of the things you can throw out is uh, that if Methuselah was the oldest man in the Bible, yet he died before his father. How can that be? Now wait a minute. Methuselah is the oldest man in the Bible, lived 969 years, yet he died before his father. Well, the kicker, of course, is that his father was Enoch. Okay? Now, that gets particularly interesting when you recognize what the name Methuselah means when it's translated. It means, um, when he is gone, it shall come. And the, the Methuselah apparently was born as a result of a revelation or a vision of the flood. And as long as Methuselah was alive, the flood would not come. Now, if you check, you know, after Methuselah came Lamech, and you go through the family tree, you get to Noah, and you find out when Noah was 601. You go through all those years, when you find out, the, the, when I think Noah was 601, the flood came. If you go back, you'll discover that was the year that Methuselah died. Isn't that interesting? Can you imagine how they watched that guy? Um, the faithful, uh, those that would be aware of this. Um, kind of interesting. Now, some people point out that Methuselah thus becomes, in a sense, a, ma- a type of grace. Because as long as he's alive, God's grace endures before the judgment comes, right? And so it's no accident that the oldest life, the longest life in the Scripture, is Methuselah, if he's a model of grace because it's spiritually significant. See? Now, it's also interesting that if if that's a model of the coming judgment, and Noah is a model of those that are preserved through that judgment, that Enoch was translated before all this happened. 
So a lot of New Testament theologians make a big thing of that, you know, gee, that maybe, you know, it's a type of the church or something. He might be, I don't know, I wouldn't press it, but if it, if, you, if, that, if that comes up, you won't be caught by surprise. It's an idea that kicks around from time to time. Uh, but now we're down to verse 6, and a very important summary. Verse 6, if you haven't learned anything else in the book of Hebrews, learn verse 6. Because it's just logical. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Very basic idea. In order to come to God, you have to believe he exists. You can't believe he's dead. You can't believe he never exists in the first place. How can you? You can't please God without coming to him, and you can't come to him if you don't believe he exists. A strange idea. Now, just believing he exists ain't very much. James tells you that. Devils also believe and tremble, so what do you got? You know, no big deal. But the writer of Hebrews points out that there's two basic ingredients. For without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must be A, believe that he is, and B, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And that's the part where revelation takes place. You can quickly come to the conclusion that God exists just with a a reasonable awareness of the universe around you. It takes an enormous amount of convoluted thinking to deny the existence of God. If you have any awareness at all of biology, physiology, astronomy, you name it, it just confronts you at every turn. In fact, you can statistically prove that any other conclusion is indefensible. But that's, not, that's no big deal, so God exists. The important part is that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, that God is a personal God, who in, who's, will, who's interested in and intervenes with your life. That's the part that's, that's, that, that requires revelation. Hebrews 11, 6, Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now we, go, now we have a, a verse on Noah here. Verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Now, um, kind of interesting. By faith, Noah being warned of God, things not seen as yet. Now, most of you think, well, that must be the flood, you know. It may be even more subtle than that. There is, a, there is a, I think, a reasonably defendable view that rain had not existed until Noah. If you read Genesis carefully, you'll discover that the, the, the water cycle was different, that the, the, the water was, uh, a mist came up of the ground. And the concept of clouds and rain did not exist until Noah. Now, whether that's valid or not, we have no way of knowing, but it is suggested. And, and so part of what, you know, this idea that it's going to rain could have been really novel, not just a big rain like 40 days, but I mean, it was just, just the idea of rain was new stuff. So uh, by faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, and incidentally, you don't have to press that. You say, well, maybe there was rain, maybe but not seen as yet. The, the level, the cataclysm that took place, and a lot of things took place to bring around, the, bring about the flood as we understand it. Uh, anyway, what did he do? He moved with fear, with respect. I don't think fear in the sense of terror. The word fear is, has many different meanings. But fear in the sense of awe, reverence, respect. He moved with fear. Prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Now, interesting. Here's an interesting dimension of that. That's kind of similar, by which he condemned the world. That's interesting. That implies that the message that Noah had, a lot of other people had, and they ignored. Coming judgment. And by Noah's accepting the message, he condemns those that didn't. Okay. And there may be an analogy in that. And that may that that may help explain Satan's hostility to a believer coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Because by accepting the gospel, the, the, the saving blood of Jesus Christ, there's, a, there's a, a, a heavier indictment on those that don't. And also Noah became an heir of the righteousness which is by faith. This is another hint here is that the real... The thing that saved Noah wasn't, don't misunderstand what the, what the writer is saying, it wasn't 
his building the ark. The thing that saved Noah is the same thing that saves you and I. The blood of Jesus Christ on a cross at Calvary some 2,000 years ago. Now, in Noah's case, it's anticipatory. But God can impute to him by faith. See, he is an heir. Noah is an heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Which is that righteousness? The righteousness that is imputed to us by, uh, in, in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's not obvious. You know, don't, don't fall into the trap of saying, gee, Noah was saved because he built an ark. No, that was a demonstration of his faith indeed. Now we get there. Now we get to Abraham. This guy is fabulous. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing where he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, and heirs with him of the same promise. Well, wait a minute now. That happens to be not the way you and I would write it. Let me tell you what really happened in Genesis 12. God told Abraham to get out and leave his kindred. Right? Put your, put your finger here and turn to Genesis chapter 12. Because you're going to learn something about our Lord here that's really worth understanding. Abraham's a man of faith, right? Great guy, right? Absolutely. But interestingly enough, um, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I'll make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. Wait a minute, I thought Lot was his nephew. What's Lot going along for? And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. What's he doing in Haran? Well, it, I won't take the time to develop all this. It turns out that Genesis 12, verse 1 says, The Lord had said to Abraham, Do all this stuff, right? Turns out he didn't do that. He moved up river. He left her of the Chaldees and went to Haran. How long did he live in Haran? A little while. Verse 32 of chapter, the previous chapter, chapter 11, and the days of Terah, that was Abram's father, were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Let me tell you what really happened. Abraham was supposed to split. He didn't. He moved up river to Haran with his dad, and who knows who else. When his dad died, he picks up and moves on. Abraham, and it's an interesting study to get into this. And if you're interested in this, you can pick it up in the Genesis tapes. You can get it from your sources. But the point is, what's interesting is, Abraham did indeed ultimately obey, but he didn't at first. Okay? He lost some time, and there's some other complications that occur. And the whole, the whole story of Abraham is worth your attention in the study of the book of Genesis. But do you remember what the Lord says? Your sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Right? Look how the Holy Spirit summarizes Abraham's walk. Verse 8, 11, 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out to, into a place which he should after receive for inheritance, obeyed. He did. There's no mention of the fact that he stumbled a little on the way. Isn't that great? You and I should take comfort in that. I do. Because my obedience at best is incomplete, faltering, you know. Should go and after and receive for inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing where he went. And indeed, you know. Now, he wasn't supposed to go down into Egypt. But down in Egypt, of course, he picks, uh, Sarah picks up a handmaid, Hagar, and what comes out of that, you know. So there's a whole thing about Abraham's worth your study. But it's interesting here that it, the Holy Spirit chooses just to not make a big deal of that stuff. And by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as, a, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. It's looking way ahead now, of course. The heirs with him of the same promise, 
For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Famous verse. You've all heard that, right? Who's looking for a city? Abraham is, right? Go in Genesis and find out where he got that revelation. No mention of a city. The writer's taken a lot for granted here. Where do we learn about the city? Book of Revelation, chapter 22. Huh? I'm going to suggest to you that Abraham was looking for a city. I'm going to suggest to you that we, he, we just happen not to have had that expression in the, in, in, in the, in the Torah, in the books of Moses. Um, Abraham acts out the offering of Isaac, right? I'm going to suggest to you that he knew he was acting out prophecy. That's why he named the place Jehovah Jireh, or Jireh Shalom, the root for Jerusalem. Um, the whole, if you haven't heard, gotten into the study of Genesis 22, I strongly urge you, it's probably my favorite chapter in the scripture, so we prattle on it for a full C90, for those of you that want to get into that. Um, look for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What are the foundations? Jesus Christ, right? There's no, one, no foundation in that which is laid, right? Christ Jesus. Okay, through verse 11, through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Did she really? She laughed. <laughs> I have pleasure in my old age, the whole thing. By the oaks of Mamre, Genesis 18. But you notice how comforting it is that the Holy Spirit summarizes this charitably. You know? I take great comfort in that. I always feel a lot easier when I know that the guy you know, writing the grades is on my side. I like that. Verse 12, Therefore sprang there even of one, and, and him as good as dead, as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore, innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Not having received them in the, in, in the direct sense, but obviously having seen them afar off. So you get the impression that they had some prophetic awareness. And were persuaded of them, and embraced them. Oh, that's interesting. It's one thing to be persuaded, that is, intellectually be, know that they exist. It's quite another to embrace them. Have you embraced the second coming of Jesus Christ? You may know he's coming back because you've heard the tapes or the films or the whatever, right? But have you embraced that? Is it a moment-by-moment, moment, day by day reality in your life? They were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had an opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, that's not, now we're speaking of Genesis 22 specifically, offered up Isaac. And he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Whoops. There we have that phrase again. Genesis 22, Abraham, offer thine only son, whom thou lovest. Right? How many sons did Abraham have? Two. Ishmael and Isaac. Huh? Interesting, though, from a, in a spiritual sense, God is blind. He's talking about the, spirit, the spiritual seed. Interesting. We see that occur in Genesis 22, and here again, the Holy Spirit deals with that way. He offered up his only begotten Son, of whom it is said, In Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, we say that Abraham was saved by faith. Faith in what? 
faith in the word, good. But specifically what? My argument? Abraham believed in the resurrection. In type. Jesus Christ, in fact, of Isaac. Abraham believed. God, you want me to offer him? Great. It's your problem. Because he's supposed to have seed. You promised me seed from Isaac. So I'll go offer him. He'll be dead. How's he going to get alive to have children? I don't know. That's your problem, God. Abraham believed in the resurrection of Isaac. One of Chuck Missler's screwball ideas? Probably, but notice verse 19. Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which also he received him in a figure, that is, in a type. Now, you know, that can mean many different things, all at the same time. Abram accounted that God was able to raise him up. Whom up? Isaac, right. From which he also received him in a figure. Who's him? Jesus Christ, in type. I personally believe, clearly, that Abram believed in the resurrection of Isaac, and it's that his, his commitment to the resurrection, if I tie 1 Corinthians 15, first four verses, to the whole story in Genesis 22, that is Abraham's awareness of God's ability to resurrect Isaac. And I also believe that Abraham knew it had a prophetic overtone. That's why he named the place Jehovah Jireh. In the Mount of the Lord it shall be seen. What shall be seen? The crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Now, how long was Isaac dead to Abraham? Romans 4 and Galatians 3 says that he was dead when the commandment came. How long did they travel to Moriah? Three days. When was Isaac, and that's when Isaac was given back. So in a, in, a, in a rabbinical sense, Isaac was dead to Abraham three days. And that's why Paul can say in 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel which I received, which you all, and so forth, he says how that Christ was... You know, um, was, um, died, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What scriptures? Old Testament? Where does it say he's going to be dead for, he's going to be in the grave three days? Genesis 22. Abraham's offering of Isaac. Interesting study if you haven't been in. Um, okay, we've got to go a little further here. Um, verse 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Now, that's a wild one. You know the story in Genesis. That was by faith? That's what it says. Now, is it glossing over some of the chicanery and arguing that by faith later he saw that it was what God's will was? Maybe. Or was that what was Rebecca had when God was dealing through Rebecca? There's all kinds of ways you can deal with this story. And uh, but that, you don't have a problem unless you really get into the Genesis, and I, I won't take the time to review Genesis tonight. Anyway, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau according to the things to come. Um, concerning things to come. Verse 20, By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, le leaning on top of his staff. Now this, what this refers to, Joseph, of course, became the prime minister of Egypt and uh, had a Gentile, took a Gentile bride, had two, ch two, two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And one of the things that Joseph, when, when they get all reunited, that uh, Joseph presents his two sons to their grandfather, Jacob. Jacob adopts them as his own sons. That's why you can have 13 tribes in Israel. The tribe of Joseph becomes two, Ephraim and Manasseh, because they're actually adopted by Joseph. But he also blesses them. And Joseph positions them so that the elder would get the right hand and the other the left. In other words, a more favored blessing. And Jacob does a strange thing. He crosses his hands. And Joseph is offended because he's blessing the younger rather than the older. And it's clear that jo Jacob knows what he's doing. God, he's, 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 he's uh, uh, dealing with that. But then Jacob does something else. He goes through the 12 sons and gives them cryptic prophecies in Genesis 49. And that's where he talks about Judah, a lot about Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. That is the Messiah. They say, all these are strange little riddles, worth your study. But he, he predicts, it's, 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 from those, it's from those descriptions that you get the history of each tribe and their characteristics. And it's worth the study. From Judah, he has a lot to say about being the royal lion, of the, the royal lion of the tri tribe of Judah. He speaks of Dan, a strange riddle. You know, a serpent shall 
bite his feet and the rider shall, so the horse shall fall backward. What's all that mean? And uh, out of that comes the tradition that the Antichrist will emerge out of the tribe of Dan. And there's all these strange ideas that come from Jacob's uh, fourth chapter of Genesis uh, making these, these prophecies. And it makes reference to it here. When he was dying, bless the sons of Joseph, both the sons of Joseph, and worship leaning upon the top of the staff. Now he's referring denotatively to Ephraim and Manasseh, connotatively to the, all the sons. Verse 22, By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Now, you know, that's a strange thing. Here is Joseph, who was um, sold by his brothers into slavery and uh, goes to this unknown land and rises from prison to become prime minister of the world. The world. I mean, you know, Egypt ran the world in those days. And uh, for him to want, you'd think that he'd want his bones buried under some big obelisk or something, right? No. He wants his bones taken back to Canaan. And um, in, uh, it's in Genesis chapter 50, verse 25, he gives the commandment to do that. In Exodus 13, 19, it describes how they wander through the wilderness carrying uh, the bones of Joseph. And when Joshua conquers the land, Joshua chapter 24, verse 32, it describes how they fulfill this commandment to have Joseph buried where? Not in Egypt, in, in the Holy Land. Interesting. Now, incidentally, those of you that want to harass uh, the firefighters or wherever can get an outline, I think, of uh, over a hundred ways that Joseph is a type of Christ. Over a hundred ways that Joseph is a type of Christ. Instituting the bread and water when he was in prison, you know, the, the baker and the, and, the, and the wine steward. Bread and water shows up there. Of course, the bread is broken. It's interesting. And, the, uh, and how he gets uh, rejected by his brethren. And uh, he's in the pit. And how he comes out and how he uh, takes a Gentile bride. It goes on and on. There's just, there's just amazing how many, if you really look for it, that there's over a hundred ways that uh, Joseph is a type of Christ. But that's off the subject. Um, we bring this down now to Moses. And I think we're probably out of time. Maybe rather than uh, we will, we'll, we'll pick it up at verse um, 23 next time uh, in, Ch- in Hebrews 11. And um, we'll go through, you know, Moses, Joshua, Rahab, and then some summaries at the end. And um, so um, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we praise you for these men of faith. We thank you, Father, that you have brought us to this revelation, that you have gone, gone so far so as to reveal yourself, your intentions, and your desires to us. We would ask you, Father, to increase in us an appetite for all these things, that you would help us to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Indeed, Father, we would just ask you to increase our faith that in all these things we might be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen.